Productions, in association with the British Broadcasting Company, presents The Curse of the Yeti, starring Richard Johnson as Sir Digby Spode and Royce Mills as Hubert Carstairs. Also starring in order of good table manners, Jeffrey Bailden as Badger, Philip Voss as Bruno Kransky, and Erica Arian as Hermione. With John Glover as Kumar, Robert Harley as the dentist, and Christopher Barr as the proprietor. Introducing P. Bassett Davis as the subservient Sherpa. And finally, with the specially sinister chords on the soundtrack, Stephen Greif as Count Laszlo Stroganoff. The Curse of the Yeti is written by Paul B. Davis and John G. Colley, produced by Walter Q. Pecksniff, and directed by A. Nixon Sutherland. Rogue Mail, The Curse of the Yeti. Diary of Hubert Carstairs, 19th of October, 1936. Several months have elapsed since I last saw my old friend Sir Digby Spode. As a result, I have enjoyed a period of blissful tranquility, during which time not once has my life been threatened by swarthy international desperadoes, nor have I been catapulted over South American ravines, nor obliged to leap into painting gondolas from moving trains. The agreeable respite from diversions of this nature has enabled me to resume my research into the life cycle of the Javanese bee. I am, nonetheless, somewhat perturbed by this unnaturally extended period of silence from the great man, and have begun to wonder whether he is suffering from one of the bouts of depressive illness to which he is occasionally prey. The paranoid delusion which typifies poor Spode's ailment is that of a huge black weasel devouring his hat collection. Many is the time he has cried, Black weasel is upon me, and has locked himself in his study for weeks on end, refusing all sustenance save boiling water and the occasional live crayfish. Therefore, as a particularly painful molar has obliged me to make an appointment with my dentist in Lower Wibbling, not five miles from Spode Towers, I have resolved to risk another transcontinental imbroglio and call on my old friend. First, however, a more disagreeable duty awaits me. There, that didn't hurt at all, did it, Mr. Carstairs? Oh, No, of course it didn't. Well, now that I've given them all a good polish, let's have a look at this troublesome molar. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid we'll have to take your pipe out of your mouth oh. if we really want to have a good look. Oh. Now, oh. open wide. Uh, is this the one? Oh. Or was it this one? Oh. Or this one back here? Oh. Yeah, there seems to be a bit of tenderness there. Drill, please, nurse. What? Thank you. Ah, ah, now just let me know if this ah, hurts, Mr. Carstairs. Ah, oh. Right, I, uh, I suggest you get back in the chair before we have a look at the cavity. Oh, yes, I'm, I'm afraid that uh, huh? in the meantime I can only offer you a temporary filling. Oh, why is that? Well, very strange thing. There seems to be a sudden world shortage of dental amalgam. Same story everywhere. Rather odd. Anyway, I'll give you the alternative. What alternative? This contoured wooden plug. Oh, oh, ah, yeah. ah, Good, that should have fixed the blighter. The pain should subside in a couple of weeks, but in the meanwhile, I think you should have a little lie down before you go back to London. Not going to London. Going to see Digby Spock. Sir Digby? Mm. Splendid. I have a rather urgent message for him. Something he'll find of vital importance. Ah. He's due for a checkup, and he hasn't paid his last three bills. I right know. I'll tell him. Ah, it's Mr. Carstairs. Oh, dear, what happened to your jaw? Did you meet with an accident? No, I met with my dentist. Hmm? Now, <clears throat> is a sedic at home? Very much so, sir. This way. Has he been locked in the study? Yes, sir. Playing the tuba? I'm afraid so, sir. How bad is it, Badger? Andal's death march for the past five weeks. Oh, dear. Well, perhaps we should telephone the hospital. I was on the point of doing so this morning when Sir Digby received a telegram from his brother Maycroft. Oh, that improved matters. I'll say. 
Listen to this. Stone. Stone. Carstairs, old man. Good to see you. Uh, that'll be all, Badger. Very good, sir. Oh, uh, before you go, Badger, sir. I wonder if you'd clean up my embouchure. Must I? Yes. Oh, very well, sir. Mm-hmm. I'll go and get my glove. Splendid news about India, Carstairs. We've won the test. No, we're going to the Himalayas. Uh, what? Yes, there's some rum business afoot, and it's vital we investigate. Mycroft sources in Kashmir have reported incredible, though it seems, that Mount Everest is shrinking. Huh? What do you say to that? Oh, I frankly spared, I couldn't care less. My tooth's killing me. Well, don't you see? The conquest of Everest is British manhood's most cherished dream. If it gets any shorter, any damn foreigner will be able to climb it. Well, good luck to him. I'm as patriotic as the next man's foot, but my dental nerves are particularly sensitive to altitude. You see a dentist. I just have done. He's administered every analgesic known to man, and I'm still in agony. Uh, what you need is hypnotism. And I know just the fellow, uh, Dr. Kumar Singh Dobiwala, the world's leading dental hypnotist. Sounds like an interesting chap. Where does he live? Delhi. Pack a bag. Hey, but Come with me as far as Delhi, then you can return here while I press on to the Himalayas. <laughs> eyes are heavy. You are in a profound trance. When I wake you, you will forget you have ever met me. You will forget my name. You will forget this house. You will leave without a word and never return. Now go. Right, let's get rid of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, Mr. Carstairs, sit on this settee oh. <clears throat> and relax completely. Yeah. Look into my eyes. Oh, yes, this is very encouraging. I perceive you are a very suggestible type. I am a very suggestible type. Amazing, he's under already. (laughs) What unconscious command do you wish me to implant, Mr. Spode? Mr. Spode. Tell him his tooth doesn't hurt. Mr. Carstairs, listen to me. Your tooth gives you no pain whatsoever. My tooth gives me no pain whatsoever. Now, when I clap my hands, you will... Wait, wait. wait. You have a problem. I wonder, while he's under, if you would mind giving him another unconscious command. Tell him he's perfectly willing to accompany me to Mount Everest and wouldn't dream of missing the adventure. And, Mr. Spode, this is most unethical. I I could be blackballed by the Royal College of Hypnologists for such a practice. Kumar, the honour of the Empire is at stake. In that case, there's no problem at all. Uh, Mr. Carstairs, you are agreeable to Mr. Spode's every suggestion. I'm agreeable to Mr. Spode's every suggestion. (laughs) Very good. Very good. But um, how can I snap him out of it when this is all over? I will teach you the secret mantra which I use in my meditation. Oh, jolly good. How does it go? You'll wonder where the yellow went... When you brush your teeth with Pepsodent. That sounds like an advertising slogan. It is. My guru has shares in the company. Did you get all that, Mr. Carstairs? Yes. Good. When I clap my hands, you will reach into your inside pocket and pay me 200 rupees. Then you will leave with Mr. Spode and accompany him on his adventures. Diary of Carstairs, November the 1st, 1936. My tooth no longer troubles me, and I feel in tip-top condition. Spode said he'd need me on the next leg of the expedition, and I couldn't help agreeing with him. Our first priority was the recruitment of Shepherds. We therefore proceeded to the native bazaar, where my comprehensive knowledge of the local dialects enabled me to make inquiries. Darry Spode, having rescued Carstairs from the angry mob who were incensed by his insults, I explained to one of the natives that we required some Sherpas. Darry of Carstairs... Spode took delivery of 23 cabbages, a pair of yaks and sack of assorted brass trinkets. <laughs> Made in Birmingham. I resumed our inquiries. In Hindi. Infuriated by Castor's interference, I told him to boil his head. What an excellent idea. Stopped a passing charwaller and asked to borrow his tureen. To my surprise, he spoke fluent English. Diary of Spode. Having located an English-speaking guide, we allowed him to escort us to the now legendary Typhoon Road Tea House, which turned out to be just the place we were looking for. Yes, gentlemen, can I help you? I'll handle this, Carstairs. Um, we are contemplating an 
expeditionary undertaking of some magnitude and require assistance, if you understand me. Here, Randy. Some English chaps here want to climb Everest. Bring it some more Sherpas. Oh, I gather then that we are not alone. By no means entirely, Sahib. Everest expedition from all the wide world gather here to get kitted out. Ah, here is Randy with a selection of Sherpas. Ah, Mr. Ford. I hear you're recruiting for your expedition. And if I am? My name is Max Pratt. Spratt? Pratt. Oh, Pratt. Sometime Baron Lundgren. Never heard of you. Surely you remember the first attempt of the Matterhorn without underwear? I'm not easily impressed by stunts, Pratt. Indeed. But what about this one? Do you see that, Spode? He walked straight up the sheer wall, across the ceiling and down the other side. Quite clever, yes. Maybe we could use you. What do you know about Sherpas? Everything there is to know. Stand back, and I will select the ones you need. All right, you Sherpas, line up. I'll start with the tallest. We'll take you. Thank you, sir. And you, and you, and you. Thank you, Sahib. You, 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 and this little chap with the long hair and the tongue hanging out. That's the dog, oh, Pratt. Oh. My mistake. Everyone else, back in the crate. I hear you're looking for men. You're not a Sherpa? I was talking to Mr. Spoke. Who are you? Does the name Bullmyers mean anything to you? Not the heroine of Bangalore. No, the Indian cookery school of Kensington High Street. Oh, my mistake. My name is Hermione Drinkwater. I have a special diploma in Tibetan dishes, and I'm very good at catering for large groups. <laughs> Dash plucky of you to offer your services, my dear, but we really need a man. So do I. Well, I, I'm afraid you can't come, and that's flat. No, I think we should take her. Splendid idea. I agree entirely. That's settled, then. We have a full complement. Thirteen in all. Ranjit! Where are those drinks I ordered? Coming, sahib, coming. Now then, uh, rum toddy for the Sherpas, mm -hmm. gin tonic for the lady, mm -hmm. vodka for Mr. Pratt, mm -hmm. brandy for Mr. Carstairs, light cheese juice for Mr. Sport, and for myself, this double whiskey and soda. No, 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 no! You get the light cheese juice, Sport gets the whiskey. No, that, too late, I have already consumed it. <laughs> My God! I didn't realize that alcohol had such a strong effect on these people. It's almost as if he'd been poisoned. Damn! I mean, damn shame to lose him. Hopefully I'll have better... I mean, we'll have better luck on Everest. <laughs> right. We'll pitch base camp here. It's a nice flat plateau, and that overhanging snow wall gives excellent protection from the wind. And where the hell are those sharpers? Hermione, what's the matter with the blighters? They're a superstitious lot, Mr. Spode. And one of them says he saw a massive black shape lumbering through the snow. Well, that's all right. Carstairs won't hurt them. They mentioned the word Yeti. Yeti? <laughs> the abominable snowman. Absolute balder dash. We're pitching camp here, whether they like it or not. Mr. Pratt will supervise. Where in the blazes is he? I left him 200 yards back on that outcrop of rock. What the devil's he doing now? Singing by the sound of it. Along the mountain track, bomb, Pratt, bomb, you idiot, me, shut up! Alarm, Any loud noise could put us in mortal danger. <laughs> danger of what? Avalanche! What? Oh. For God's sake, Pratt, stop shouting! Look out! Spook! Hermione! Take cover! Mr. Spode, but I'm afraid your expedition is completely out of the window. Pratt, you lethal idiot. If I didn't have these mitts on, I'd strangle you with my bare hands. Steady, steady, Spode. We may need all the extra manpower we can get. That snowfall was the final straw for the Sherpas. Look, they're all deserting. Damn. Hermione, did you see where they went? Sorry, couldn't stop them. They're off down the slopes, heading for home. 
all except the headman, that is, who seemed to be heading for the northeast face. Impossible, and also impossible. I agree. Where could he possibly have gone? Come on, you blasted yet is harder, harder. There'll be no rest for any of you till all the hoppers are loaded. I want another five tons down from the summit by nightfall. Master, master. Yes, what is it? I've come hot foot from the spoiled expedition, sub, using the secret pass. Ah, are you quite sure no one saw you? Mm. It is vital no one discovers this operation of mine. Quite sure, sub. Mm. And has Kransky, or perhaps I should call him Max Pratt, no. <laughs> disposed of them yet? Not quite. They continue to hang on by the skin of their teeth. <laughs> I hope they freeze to death on the mountain. This is indeed distinctly possible. They have lost most of their equipment and now have only two sleeping bags between the four of them. <laughs> Good. Still, you can't be too careful with Spode. You and four Yeti go to the Englishman's camp. If there's anyone still alive, bring them to me. Yes, master. <laughs> Right, let's go through this again. There are two tents, two sleeping bags, and four people. So we'll have to double up, by my calculations. Hermione, who do you want to share with? Pratt, Costas, or me? Can't I take it in turns? No, you cannot. You better go with Pratt. Uh, come in with me, Costas. All right, Spud. Okay. All right, you go first. Go on. Uh, that's a bit better, out of the wind. Hey, open up. I refuse to share with the woman. In that case, Carstairs goes with Hermione, huh? and I go with you, Pratt. Get out of the tent, Carstairs. All right, Spade, whatever you say. Good. We're all settled. Look, I don't like to be awkward, Mr. Spode. But I wonder if I could come in with you. Very well, then. <clears throat> Aren't you get Pratt? And Hermione, if you can just squeeze in here. Oh, right, I just That's it. Here. Now, now, zip up the tent. No, 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 no. It's quite impossible. Mr. Carstairs is much too fat. I heard that, Pratt. I find it most offensive. Spode, I know what I'm not wanted. I'm going outside, and I may be some time. You are outside, Carstairs. Well, in that case, I'm going to find myself a snow hole. Good night, and good riddance to the lot of you. Damn typical cock-up. Expedition full of women and foreigners. Can't think why I came. Must have been out of my mind. Oh, I suppose I'll have to uh, wedge myself into this shallow crevasse and... Who? Who goes there? Spode? Is that you? No. It's no use apologizing, Spode. I've made my mind up. I'm perfectly happy out here. Now get your great hairy hand off my shoulder, Spode. Now put me down, Sp Spode. That is you, isn't it? Spode? Oh, no. Oh, my God. Ah, 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 help! Help me! Ah! You hear something, Hermione? No, it's probably just the wind. Ah, oh, Mr. Spode. I feel so secure here next to you, but I'm still just a teeny bit cold. Perhaps you should put your clothes back on. Oh, no. I can get closer to you this way. In fact... If you would just remove your anorak and your duffel coat and this jersey... Now, steady on, old girl. Don't get carried away. I know what you're driving at, and it's, it's quite impossible. Have you tried? Well, of course I haven't. On an adventure like this, while a chap needs to conserve his strength. Besides, these tents are damned flimsy. Too many sudden movements and a guy rope could suddenly... Nothing. Now settle down. Oh, Mr. Spode, you're so stern and masterful. Scold me again. Don't be ridiculous. Try and get some sleep. Oh, damn it. What's going on out there? Pratt! Pratt! 
Is that you? What are you doing? Merely answering the call of nature. With a Swiss army knife? My fly buttons were frozen over. Well, careful what you're doing. We don't have the first aid kit anymore. Too bad, Mr. Spood. Once I've cut this final guy rope, you may well be needing it. Bon voyage. Oh, that man Pratt. He's nothing but a damned liability. I should never have brought him with us. I blame myself. For that. Come back to bed, Digby. Here, snuggle up <clears throat> against me. <clears throat> There, that's better. Mm, mm. Have to say that. <laughs> oh, 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 can you feel the earth move? Yes, I've come to mention it. I, I believe I can. Damn bumpy it is, too. Yes, yes. Uh, oh, oh. oh, yes, yes. Uh, 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 hang on, old girl. Just going to look outside. Oh, don't leave me now. No, I, I can just about reach the zip from here. And... Uh, <laughs> Oh, God! We're moving! Oh, no! What's happening? Ah! Darius spoke. 7th of November, 1936. I have been in some tricky scrapes in my life, but few so desperate. We were wedged in a sleeping bag, gathering speed down a knife-edged spur. It was then that a flailing guy rope caught on a rock and we were projected out of the tent. Ah! But our problems were not over. We were still in the sleeping bag's python-like grip and now approaching terminal velocity as we hurtled down the near vertical slope. Shielding my eyes against the blinding snow, I perceived a vast chasm rushing towards us. I barely timed to maneuver Hermione into the classic tandem ski jump position perfected by Nostrum and Nostrum of Norway before we hit the upturned lip of the gorge and were projected high into the celestial void. Above the cloud line, the Himalayan night sky was peppered with stars. Sighting along Hermione's hair grip, I was able to plot our position as being directly over the bottomless gorge, which has long rendered Everest's northwest face inaccessible. Descending through the clouds, an astonishing sight awaited us. At last! What <clears throat> kept you? Yes, all right, all right. I'm not interested in excuses. Who's that hanging on the pole? It's me. You were cast as, and I demand to be put down immediately. <laughs> Release him. Strong enough. I might have known you'd have had a hand in this. We've had nothing but trouble since we left Delhi. What are you up to this time, you blackguard? Insolence! Oh, I... I'll ask the questions. First, where is that meddling spode? You'll never get me to talk. Right. Yet is. Hurl him off the precipice. What? I can't torture a man who's wearing so many clothes. Oh, wait. No. I will not give you a last request. I have had it with last requests. Every time I grant you and Mr. Spoe the request, I get nothing but trouble. I just wanted to draw your attention to the rather spectacular comet which is rushing towards us. Oh, oh bored of that. Yet is, hurl him over the edge. Ah, oh, take cover. <laughs> Mist, you two at the bottom of the crater. Come out with your hands up. Thank you. All right. Am I any old thing? Still a bit cold. Better put my tops back on. Yeah, well, I, I, I think I'll be all right in these woolly kongs. Mr. Spode and Miss Drinkwater. Ah, how very considerate. You've saved me the trouble of looking for you. Strong enough. Custos. <laughs> what the devil's going on here? It's too late, Mr. Spade, and I have work to do. There is no time for lengthy explanations. But perhaps before you plunge to your doom, you would like to admire the workings of Stroganoff Amalgam Amalgamated. Amalgam? Yes. You see, Spode, the summit of Everest is the last great deposit of dental amalgam. For months now, I have been chiseling it off and hoarding it away. Half the governments of the world are already suffering from a raging toothache. Very soon I will be in a position to hold them all to ransom. <laughs> Brilliant. Mm, I knew you'd appreciate it. But as far as I knew, no man had reached the summit of Everest. Correct. No man. But the Yeti have been doing it for years. And once I had taught them the principles of open-cast mining... Wait, wait, wait. How, how did you get them to obey you? 
<laughs> that was my master stroke. I employed the services of a Delhi hypnotist to bend these creatures to my will. In which case, there must be some phrase which releases them from the trance. Yes, but take that hopeful look off your face, Berg. You'd never guess it in a million years. Maybe not, unless it happens to be... You'll wonder where the yellow went when you brush your teeth with Pepsodent. What? No, this is monstrous. Spell, you thieving cheat. How did you find the secret mantra? From an acquaintance, and it seems to have done the trick. You must obey me. No, put me down. No. <laughs> well, that's the last we'll see of Stroganoff. Yes, and our friend Kransky over there seems to be in for a similar fate. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Spurred. Can you put me straight over a couple of points? Far away. Spurred. Where the devil are we? And how the blazes did I get here? Now, stay beyond, Costas, old man. I can explain everything, and I don't. Diary of Hubert Carstairs, 22nd of November, 1936. Bruised, battered, and frostbitten from my involuntary excursion up Everest, I have retired to my sister's house in Bath for a period of rest and recuperation. Much has changed in the last two weeks. In particular, my feelings for Sir Digby Spode. The affectionate esteem in which I once held him is now replaced by dull resentment. No matter how I try to justify it in my mind, I cannot see the trick he played on me as anything other than dastardly. I have expressed this to him in writing, adding that I do not want to meet him in the foreseeable future and that I will never, ever accompany him on one of his harebrained excursions again. The end. Pull back slowly and fade gradually to black. And if you tune in next week, you can find out whether Hubert Carstairs does go on the final adventure with Sir Digby Spode. <laughs>